welcome everyone to this panel. Um, we're going to be asking, is there a future for the musician? Now, I definitely think there is, but I have an incredible um, expertise across the panel here today. And we're going to be looking at the value of music in society. We'll explore why musicians will be a vital part of the job market of the future. And looking also at the positive impact of the arts on our cities, our economy and our health. And I am absolutely delighted to, to introduce my panelists today. I think it's going to be a really fascinating conversation, but I know that they can introduce themselves far better than I can. So uh, starting with Gerard, would you mind please just introducing yourself? Um, hello, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I'm an economist. I have a portfolio of roles, some in the financial sector uh, with Bank of China. I'm a non-exec director in, here in London. Also in university sector, I've been on the advisory board of the Grant Room Institute of Climate Change and the Environment since its inception. And so I'm involved in different areas. And I've written a bit recently about the creative sector, thinking that we su should support it through the crisis and in the future. Great to be here. Brilliant. Thank you, Jared. Welcome. Um, Barbara? Hello, I'm Barbara Osborne. I'm the Chief Executive of uh, Music in Hospitals and Care. We're a national UK-wide charity that improves the health of children and adults through the healing power of live music. Last year, we shared 4,500 live music sessions thanks to 438 musicians um, across the UK. So obviously, we've got a huge pool of musicians um, that we can reference, and we're really looking forward to taking part in the panel today. Brilliant. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, Danny, next, please. Hello, everybody. My name's Danny Keir. I am from uh, a, company, a small new company called Enki Music. Uh, we are artist management um, consultancy for um, music export and for kind of artist development in new markets. Um, I've spent the past six years of my life working on cultural policy with a company called Sound Diplomacy. So I can talk a little bit to the role of music in society from a kind of from a few different angles. Um, and yeah, I've been an artist manager for about 15 years. So yeah, that's me. Lovely to be here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Danny. Uh, Carol? Thanks, Sammy, and hello, everyone that's watching. Um, great to be here. What a super thing to be involved with. Um, I'm Carol Main, and I'm director of Live Music Now in Scotland. Live Music Now is a charity that was started by Yehudi Menuhin in the late 1970s, and it aims to support emerging artists at the start of their professional careers with fairly paid performing opportunities and training, and at the same time, get very high quality live music to people who wouldn't generally have the opportunity to experience it. So that might be older people in care homes, children in special needs schools, people in hospices, people in remote areas, refugees, and so on and so forth. So we've, uh, our name is about live music, but we've had to reinvent ourselves online um, since March and uh, have done a lot of video concerts. It was really important for us to keep connected with our artists and to keep connected with our audiences as well. Brilliant, thank you. And last but by no means least, uh, Stefan, please. Yes, thank you. So uh, my name is Stefan Masonok. I work at uh, the OECD, uh, the Directorate for Education and Skills. So like Gerard, I used to be an economist, but now I'm more of a social scientist working on, on education and actually working on how education system should prepare youngsters for the skills of the future, for innovation. Um, and part of it is, you know, what is the role of arts education and music education into, into this? Wonderful. I actually, I had a little look at your, some of your work and it's, it's brilliant. And I'm looking forward to, to chatting about it a bit during this panel. So just before we dive in and, and pick your brains, all of you on everything, just wanted to give a sort of a really broad perspective on on me put it at 5.2 to the perspective uh fishing brings in a 1.4 billion and i'm pretty sure the music industry has no such arguments that it's having you know over brexit as we are with the fishing industry, but we are, the music industry as a whole is an incredible contributor to the economy. Um, but 
no one on this call um, would be surprised to, to learn that it's been a devastating year for the sector in many areas, whether that's closed venues, festivals, the ability for people to be able to, to perform in person. Um, and we're gonna dig into some of that today, but um, I touched very quickly there on the, uh, on the figures, Gerard, but as you are one of the UK's leading economists, I'm gonna jump straight in with you, please. Could we, can you tell us a bit more about sort of the true economic value of the UK music industry? And also maybe we could chat around some of the financial benefits generated by a thriving UK uh, music sector. Yeah, the, uh, well, following on from your comments, it's very much a case that the music is a significant, but relatively small part of the UK economy. It's very hard to measure its full economic impact, but one can try and do that by looking at it both in direct and indirect terms. And let's take each in turn. The direct effect, and to appreciate how it's viewed by politicians and policy makers, one has to accept that music is part of the creative sector. Now, the creative sector is one of the fastest growing parts of the UK economy. Indeed, the creative sector was generating jobs at twice the pace of the rest of the economy prior to this crisis, although it has been hit harder along with tourism than probably any other part of the economy, as well as the hospitality. So creative, tourism, hospitality all hit hard and within that music hit very badly. Now the creative sector covers a vast array of areas from IT software to film, TV, music. And music is clubbed in together with the visual and performing arts. Now those areas, visual and performing arts are very different to music, but they're put together from the national statistics and one of the challenges therefore is that we might well be under measuring the impact of music. Now that small part of the creative sector, music, visual performing arts is about nine and a half billion pounds, which is half a percent of the UK economy. Now, thankfully last year, UK music took it one step further and said, let's break out the music component and see how big it is, which is where that figure, Sammy, you came up with of 5.8 billion comes from, which is about 0.3% of the UK economy. So it's uh, not great in size, but important. It is just under about 200,000 people who are employed within music. So quite significant and very importantly, it's regional, given that we have a very imbalanced economy, the regional component of the music sector is vital to stress and it covers within the economic aspect, it covers different components. There's the word on the page, there's recorded music, there's live music and to a lesser extent, there's the sort of brands associated with the bigger names. So there's a multitude of different aspects of the music sector. So in direct terms, it's important. And in addition to generating that 5.8 billion to the UK economy, it adds about 2.6, 2.8 billion pounds in terms of exports. Both overseas and attracting tourism. The indirect part is equally important, although it's very hard to quantify. In qualitative terms, it's become more evident during this crisis. As we had lockdown and the, for the music the business model hasn't worked out of the economy. They've not worked too well with lockdown. But what's become very evident is that the ecosystem of cities is very interlinked with music. Just look at London. The ecosystems that make cities a lot interesting place to live, work and visit has been highlighted in this crisis and music plays an important part. Also the OECD in particular has talked about the fact that the creative sector including and in mental health and again that's been pulled to the fore through this crisis. And the last point I would add is looking ahead the UK economy is becoming very global post-Brexit. And one important part of that is soft power. And the music industry in the UK plays a very important part, not only in terms of exports, that direct impact I talked about earlier, but also indirectly through soft power. So it's important now, it's been hit hard, unfortunately, through this crisis. But as we come out of the crisis, music plays an important part not only in coming back together again. Oh, 
Hello, did you get that? Yes, so, sorry, it's a very typical lockdown issue. My Zoom just went in and out for a moment there. Sorry. Sorry, sorry about that. My side going, that's the fear everyone has. They're talking. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm hoping it will stay throughout this. It was fine for the rest of the day until now. But um, thank you so much for putting that into perspective because it it is important and it's left out of a lot of stuff. And we're, we're going to dig in a lot further to this today. But there, there are some areas of the music industry that have thrived during this period. Whilst, whilst there's been absolute decimation of the live industry, you know, things like music streaming is up, recorded is up, gaming is up. So... It's not, it's not all a complete horror story, is it, across the whole industry? There, there are some, some parts of our industry that, that are doing okay throughout COVID. That's right. In fact, if you take the music sector, really UK music breaks it down into four parts. And there's the, so on the page music, the musicians, that talent, that has done well. The recorded music has done very well. Uh, the, so those two parts have done well. The third part, the live music, which is important in terms of live music venues. And that's important at a regional level. In fact, it was reported that each live music venue in the UK tends to host on average 197 performances during the year. So that's been the bit that's been very, very visual and has suffered. And the last part is the brand, which is less important. I think one of the biggest challenges from a policy perspective is that the music industry, I won't say is buried in the detail, but it's seen as one component of the creative sector. And the government has provided a lot of help to the creative sector. Then as you touched on Sammy, it looks at the big stars within the music sector that are doing well. And therefore the parts that are suffering haven't done so well. And in terms of the chancellor, for instance, he's been very generous and the data are about 2.9 million people excluded from all the various government schemes for a various combination of reasons but that unfortunately includes many self-employed people including some within the music sector yeah and ma many self-employed have not received any of if a lot of help for all throughout this period, which, which we're aware of. And I think that's something that we're going to dig into further because a lot of, when we're talking about musicians, actually a lot of them are, are self-employed and then that can be across a range of stuff. I think it's very, it can be very confusing for people to see the big figures generated by the large record labels and, and to be thrown by that. But there is also um, a UK parliamentary inquiry at the moment into the economics of streaming that are looking at whether people can live you know, on, on an income from streaming. And that's playing out at the moment. If anyone wants to catch up, they've already had one um, and they've got another one coming up soon. So just digging further, I guess, into to regional. So um, Danny and also Jared, I'll probably come to you on a bit of this, but you spoke at TEDx on the concept of music cities, which I think is really interesting. And I want you to, to dig into that a bit, please, Danny. Um, but also, can you tell us a little bit, in your opinion, what impact music has on in, inner cities and urban regeneration? And we'll get a few more opinions on this. But Gerard, thank you for laying that out. It's good for us to know where, as a starting point. Gerard, you, you, uh, you stole one of my uh, buzzwords, the, the music ecosystem, which is something I've been leaning heavily on to describe this kind of concept. Um, I, I, and I'll, I'll try and unpack that a little bit further, but I, I guess, you know, the, the concept of a music city is kind of designed to acknowledge, support and celebrate the environment in which music is created and music can flourish. So it's effectively, I guess, identifying the assets from a grassroots perspective, the, the support in businesses and infrastructure, the, the kind of uh, the performance assets and then all of the other kind of influences that music is kind of uh, beholden to, for example, licensing and infrastructure uh, and, and policy, for, uh, et cetera. So I think when we think about music cities, it's kind of been given a little bit of a bad rap, mainly by the fact it's been used as a marketing tool by many US cities to try and kind of, you know, put themselves on the map for, you know, to showcase how vibrant they are and, and how great that their kind of you know cities are but i think fundamentally it goes it goes an awfully lot deeper and if we think about a music city being a place in which artists can freely 
create. There, there are access to the, the, the tools and the assets and, and the performance and the rehearsal spaces, the education um, and all manner of other support. Then we can kind of start to understand the, the, the kind of the concept, but also how music is a, a bit more of a, a value capture mechanism within cities in order to create further vibrancy. So when we think about the most attractive cities in the world, as I've touched upon some of the American cities, we think about you know, how vibrant their nightlife is and how the nighttime economy kind of adds not only um, economic value, but reputational and, and kind of how that filters through to the creative sectors, particularly to music. And also how we can kind of look at music being um, a stimulant for all of the things. Wherever there is a vibrant music economy, there are often you know, flourishing tech sectors and hospitality and art scenes, you know, it's, it's kind of only recently recognized as a kind of, as a driver of this kind of, or a stimulant of, of this kind of thing. So I think when we look regionally and we look at our cities, particularly just in the UK, and we think about, the, you know, the, I mean, I'm obviously not from London, I'm from, I'm from North Wales, and I've spent a lot of time across the north of England. And if we think about those cities that, you know, Manchester, Liverpool, Sheffield, Leeds, those cities that have really interesting, vibrant, dynamic, grassroots music create, creators. We understand kind of what attracts people to those places and we understand how that investment then is, is stimulated through that. So I guess, you know, that for, from my point of view, the, the value of the, of the concept of music city and how, cities and how it can be applied to all places is recognizing its value in the broader ecosystem of a city, how it is kind of a, a complementary influence and not a challenging influence like it is seen in terms of the, you know, the, the, the connotations, uh, negative connotations around nighttime economy. It's kind of displaying actually music is, it brings people together, it makes people happier. It's, a, and, you know, I think some of the things we'll touch on in this conversation is about mental health. It's about actual physical health and, and recovery. And, you know, music is an incredibly powerful tool cognitively. Um, and if we think about, you know, the workforce of the future and an actual value to society as a, as a contemporary value adds that music, um, if applied in the right strategic way can be, extremely valuable yeah de definitely We're, without a shadow of doubt and i mean we, we are definitely going to dig into some of the the impact of music on on both mental health and and physical health i mean in in terms of of regional hits across covid do, do we think that one, one of the big things one of the big issues with everything that's been happening especially across government is them trying to make out that actually music's apparently not viable anymore and that everyone should go and retrain. And we're, we're gonna have a look at some of this, but in, in your view, does COVID in any way, post COVID, if we put a post COVID uh, view on things, I saw that a vaccine had been approved today. So it sounds like we're moving in the right direction. Is Are things like music cities in this, the, the thriving regional hubs, are they viable post-COVID? Yeah, it's, it's interesting. And I, and I think in terms of how sophisticated the measures are becoming to mitigate any of the potential issues, I know, for example, just to kind of slightly digress, but I'll get back to the point, you know, the Great Escape Festival, for example, the, the, the news from there is that they are planning to go ahead in, in, a, in as full capacity as possible. So thinking about how, you know, these bigger organizations that are planning these kind of inner city festivals and how congested those spaces become, the, the measures in place are rapidly developing. So the quicker that happens, the quicker we can be more kind of educated in how we discuss this stuff. But, you know, I think it, the, the, the biggest issue with COVID is it has exposed the lack of resilience around certain elements of the music industry. That being said, you know, there are elements of it, as, as we've kind of briefly mentioned, around the digital output and digital kind of um, infrastructure around music that, ha that have kind of accelerated growth and some of the, the new tools that have developed, which have meant, you know, a lot of artists that maybe would have traditionally gravitated towards a, you know, a, a significant industry centre like London may not need to do that moving forward. So, you know, there's, there's that element of it. 
I think the biggest issue is how the recovery process from a from the kind of physical assets of, of a music city in terms of its venues and its rehearsal spaces, how that can kind of play out over the next little time. And that obviously kind of falls into the hospitality sector as well, because the two industries are incredibly symbiotic in that sense. So, you know, I think there's, there's that element. I, I do want to kind of touch upon the fact that, you know, when we look at our kind of urban centers and we look at how they've been developed over the past you know, 40 years, they've been built as these kind of avenues of commerce, which has kind of pushed out housing and it's pushed out kind of a lot of the kind of nightlife into different zones. And I think there's going to be a reinterpretation of that moving forward in terms of access to spaces for creators, in terms of how we can revalue and reevaluate how those spaces are occupied by creators to then enforce vibrancy in these kind of more derelict retail spaces that that have been emerging i mean even over the past 10 years but you know there's there's certain examples of that around the country and i'm not sure i don't want to dwell on this too much but i'm not sure if any of you have been to wrexham at all in north wales but there's a festival there called focus wales and that's kind of a, a similar concept to the south by southwest great escape kind of model of inner city festivals but there, there's a there's a venue there which is an art space year round, which effectively now occupies a former JJB Sports uh, shop on the high street, which was vacant for a short while. They took it over, and now it's an incredible community asset, incredibly vibrant with with local crafts and and activities. And what that has done is it stimulated the whole part of the high street. So the shoe store next door and the bookstore uh, on the other side of it have actually renewed their leases so that they've remained in the street whereas before they would have left because there's no there's no business so you know I think re, re kind of interpreting these spaces in our kind of urban centers is how we're going to see that change and that will happen more in the regions than it will in places like London for example yeah and and the support from the associations like AIM and and, and kind of people like that where they're looking for the regional champions they're looking to stimulate those regional music economies and they're actually able now through a lot of the work that's happened over the past few years by uh, the music venues trust and and uk music and sound diplomacy my former company you know that there's much more identification around the value of this stuff and also what where the focus is could lie to then stimulate growth so yeah there's more education there's more there's more intelligence out there now and i think post covid it's high it's the the need is to focus on these things as new spaces to create music and and especially the regions i mean it, it... I'm originally from Yorkshire and felt that I needed to move to London to be within the music industry. But I've heard of a few incredible schemes actually lately. Tal, Tal Yard, where our offices are based, it's I can only say this until January, but it's Europe's, Europe's biggest crea creative community have just bought an old mill in, in Wakefield and they are replicating their entire model with studios, rehearsal space, event space, and it's right opposite a gallery called the Hepworth but it, it's regeneration in into those areas and I think we've heard a lot of the government actually about leveling up you know up in in the north but the arts presumably definitely has a part to play there if, and there's a some weird democratization of whether you do or don't need to be in London anymore which presents a bit of a real opportunity doesn't mm. it and you know everyone's gone remote but Gerard I'd love to get your thoughts around a bit of this please as well yeah, um, yeah just a few things First, in terms of the post-COVID, it's important to stress that we have a sort of two-speed economy almost. Parts of the UK economy have started to recover already. We had a big hit in March, April, and since May, the economy has been picking up. Some parts of it are doing very well, whereas other parts are very moribund, and that's likely to continue post-crisis for some time. And that is very much reflected in the music industry, where one size clearly doesn't fit at all. Um, the, some people now have very high savings, some people are spending a lot at home. So some parts of the music industry, the recorded music, those bits that are able to monetize the online side are doing very well. But the other parts, and Danny's just touched on it, their business model for the live part does not work in the vaccine gap phase. And that will take some time to recover. But on top of that, this COVID one can look at as a sort of sort of one-off effect maybe it was a big shock it might take us some time to recover 
to recover. But at the same time, there are some structural, longer term lasting effects superimposed on top of this. One of those is the change in the future of work and the COVID crisis, if anything, will accelerate that. That might well mean that um, less people go to the office to work, although if people do return to the office, as I expect them to, to city centres, they might be more flexible. That will impact naturally their discretionary spending when they go out after work. It might not be five days a week, who knows, three or four days a week. But also another, and to conclude, the, the other structural change that's happening is the changing nature of the high street itself. And that could create a big opportunity for the music industry, as Danny touched on the community aspect. But at the same time, the whole emphasis in the UK is often about residential, build more homes, there's a housing shortage. And the mixed nature of the high street in the future will see more residential properties coming in. And that could, the danger of that is it could crowd out some areas, including the music sector, but the music sector needs to be competing and it might be easier to do this regionally than in parts of London. It needs to compete for a greater footprint, shall we say, in that changing high streets of the future as well. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. We've already seen, my partner has restaurants and we've seen a, a, a real change in terms of our residential area restaurants that are nowhere near a high street. One of them's next to a canal has mm. survived throughout and thrived throughout. They're mm. one in the city centre in Oldgate, hasn't opened since February. And there's a real, people are, are gravitating slightly more to staying where they are. And that sense of community, mm. real sense of community, I think that COVID's weirdly given us, that, that could be used to propel a lot of the creative arts if they fight for the spaces and are, and are given chances to thrive. But um, does anyone else wanna, I'm wary that we haven't heard from anyone else yet. and. Let's step on a view of anything on uh, on re urban regeneration or the regions. Well, not really, actually, but I, <laughs> I want to say that it's another type of, of uh, ecosystem, which is innovation ecosystem as well, you know, and how you know the industry and the cultural sector actually plays a role in that. We do a lot of work, not us in education at the OECD on that. And actually there is another meeting which is currently going on this week on that with the European Commission that people may actually be also uh, interested in. I just, I'm, I'm gonna jump straight in with you on something else then, because we've, we're looking at you know, the impact on, on the regions, the economy, but the, the work that I found of yours online is genuinely fascinating. And I hope that th this conference might be able to post some links to it somewhere. But, um, you've been digging into the value of creativity and, and critical thinking, um, amongst other things. Because when we're, when we're talking about creative industries or music industry, I mean, we could be talking about anything. It's so vast. We could be talking about education. We could be talking about musicians. We could be talking about industry, therapy. Um, can you talk me a little talk me through that a little bit can we just dive into a bit of yeah. creativity and critical thinking and a bit of your research um, with pleasure why is it so important yeah so actually let me start by saying that all this work comes from uh, an interest in the economy you know it all came from you know how do we do we prepare people for innovative societies how we you know prepare them to cope with digitalization and how are all these things going to change and so when you start working on that, you know, some of the contenders are, uh, you know, we need more scientists and engineers, we need more entrepreneurs, but also some people say, you know, we need more creativity and so we need more artists and, uh, you know, arts education. So that's really where, how we started to get interested in, in, in that area and started to look at, you know, what science education had to bring to people, what kind of skills beyond you know, the subject matter, what arts education, and which is a variety of different disciplines uh, had to bring as well. And so we looked at arts education and had the book on that, on the evidence of what type of other skill than actually subject uh, knowledge it would bring to people uh, and went to, you know, these skills on creativity. So first thing I would like to say that, you know, the music education, obviously the first aim and why we still want it to, to be in school is so uh, that people learn about music, you know, that's uh, not the mathematics or other things. But 
you know, one of the big questions is how can all these things contribute to all these other skills which actually employers uh, care about. And those currently on top of that, please, you have critical thinking, you have creativity, you have complex problem solving. We also know that the people who work in innovative jobs, those are also the skills that they use the most. And so how do we prepare people for, for, for this uh, thing? The second aspect of it is actually related to well-being. Even so, we like the economy, we are also very much, uh, and actually creativity and critical thinking and some other skills happen to be some of those skills that people enjoy, that we human beings like, you know. So creativity, there is good evidence on, on in psychology that actually makes people happier. I would say critical thinking makes some people happier, but it's good for, um, you know, um, our democracy and citizenship, etc. So, you know, there is something which is very important uh, in that. So we've been working on, on that with the idea of, so how do we actually support education systems to, you know, empower people with more creativity, critical thinking and some of these other things. It's an agenda that most teachers don't disagree with. And so the big question is how do we make it happen? So some people believe that there is a division of labor. So some disciplines like science and mathematics, you know, will bring critical thinking, others like music, education, visual arts, etc., will actually develop creativity. And what we found or what we've actually shown and argued is that this is not the case, that all disciplines have to try to do it intentionally. And you know, you have to develop methods for that. And that's true for music education. So we need actually the musicians, the music educators to, to try to intentionally develop these different skills and actually can, you know, do it in their domain. So not by trying to do it in a generic way, but by really changing their ways of approaching uh, uh, music education. And so I would say that's really the most important message that you know, it's not because you are an artist or you are part of a creative industry that actually necessarily you will develop people's creativity, but there is obviously um, something in that, you know, the medium itself makes it easier in some ways if you actually uh, uh, do it in the right way. And perhaps another point which is interesting for, from an economic perspective and uh, or for the, you know, you were talking about, um, you know, the crisis from musicians and how they should retrain, etc. I think that, you know, it's not necessarily about retraining themselves, but it's how they can contribute to all other things. And I think like in the case of education, there is very one interesting model that actually was developed in England and then spread to other parts of the world. You know, that's this model called creative partnerships where you have a creative agents, so musicians in some cases working with teachers. Uh, they don't retrain as teachers. They're just actually working together with teachers to support them in making the teaching more creative and pay more attention to the creativity of their students by changing a little bit their methods, challenging them in many ways, uh, because at the end of the day, that's really also what uh, this is all about. So there is a lot of contribution that, um, you know, musicians can, can do right now. And I would say this is as important post-COVID than it was before. I just cannot see why innovation will become less important now, why actually digitalization may continue to accelerate. And so a lot of these skills, you know, we know that we, we tend to say that uh, um, we need skills which are, you know, make people more human and that AI and all these other things cannot touch on creativity. Well, in fact, in music, we know that it is not totally true. Uh, but nonetheless, I tend to believe that people will continue to be interested in, in, in you know, developing all these new aspects that possibly a machine indeed, you know, would have much more difficulties, much more difficulties to do. Yeah, really interesting. But also, I, it just makes sense, doesn't it, to some degree that we we need a level of creativity and, and critical thinking, ideally across any job you want to do. But in terms of music education, I mean, sadly, music education in the UK has, has been hit a bit over the last few years. There's been a, a, a move to remove some of the arts education and, and music education, which doesn't sound, from what you're saying, like a very good idea at all um it isn't it really it, it really you know it, it in fact you know what you what we want schools to do is to to transmit different facets of human knowledge the thing that we, we nurture and in many cases you know the fixation obsession about um content is 
not you know so important in fact you know because we learn a lot of things so that we forget them and it's not a big deal if we forget them you know that's uh, what is important is that we know that we can learn them and you know hopefully we'll remind some of these di different things but you know the idea that if we do one less a chapter of this it matters a lot is actually uh, not true i must say that i don't know for the uk specifically but you know the idea that the arts education is actually declining it's not fully true in many places uh, it's very stable it has small room, but it's still there. So I think that's something which is quite important. Where it's more of an elective domain, uh, also actually arts are more hit than music. Actually music is really the one that is the most researched and uh, music and visual arts are very stable in um, you know, formal education curricula, which is not true for other arts like dance or drama, or some of the other ones, you know, so that, uh, so it's not, I would say music, musicians cannot complain too much on, the, on that, usually speaking. Um, but, and actually I would say that, you know, they should be also part of, uh, not so much trying to defend a music as um, something that will help you to do other things, but actually to be proud about what it, it brings you. One of, of these, for example, is really conscientiousness, flow, um, Actually, so there are some other uh, aspects, but actually I don't want to mention them unless you force me to, uh, because I think that's not the point, you know, at the end of the day. But uh, but, but we're but we're we're hopeful that, especially I guess music education or if that's not going anywhere pre or post or during COVID, that that the the need for creative thinking and learning is that that's here and it's staying. That's viable post COVID. It is, I believe so. I, I sincerely hope so. Um, have, have anyone want, got anything to say around this topic? I just wanted to say that one of the things that we've been talking about a lot um, within um, our team and thinking about the portfolio of community musicians that we work with and just everything that has happened over the kind of lockdown and the period that, that has been happening most recently is that we mustn't um, forget that musicians feel really devalued and one of the things that we have been exploring is the way that um, the way that maybe the economy or the politicians or the policymakers are thinking about them is, do they think that because they are creative, they will find a way through it? So I'm quite struck by what Stefan's saying around, you know, the creativity and the critical thinking, as we were wondering, you know, is it, are they not considering that it's such an issue because they believe they are creatively thinking about other ways to adapt and evolve um, to the current landscape and beyond. Interesting question. Stefan, any thoughts? I'm not sure. I think that um, obviously, you know, we know that uh, um, musician or artist is not one of the um, most paying jobs. And actually, we know that in many cases, on average, uh, of course, that some of them are well paid, but uh, on average, it isn't. And actually, we know that um, most of the people who do it actually don't do it and know it, you know. So the idea, for example, all the advice saying that you shouldn't actually do, let's say, arts education because you're not going to get the wage that you believe is... Uh, you know, telling people what they already know in many cases, you know, that uh, they want to do it nonetheless. Uh, but I think there needs to be a change also in, in the um, employer mindset in many ways, you know, because they tend to underestimate all the other things that you have learned uh, to become a musician and that you can actually deploy. So there is no, uh, you know, there is a, now the fact that right now, you know, it's quite difficult, you know, for live music to be out is unfortunately a reality uh, in many places and there is you know not so much it depends on the country in some countries you know they are currently supported by the state in some way uh, the question is how long that can last um, and what uh, they, they can do you know that's um... Carol Yes, thanks very much. Um, it's fascinating listening to all the presentations so far. Thank you so much for it. Puts our own work in um, a context that it was perhaps partly in before and even gets more into, particularly thinking about economic recovery. 
Um, but in terms of music and musicians, that's very much where we are, um, where we have been since, as I said, Menuhin started live music now in 1977. And um, I can't speak for the rest of the UK, but in Scotland, there was a debate in the Parliament um, presented um, by Tom Arthur, one of our MSPs here, who convenes the cross-party group on music. And there is cross-party support for musicians, undoubtedly. Um, and for musicians getting out of here with viable careers. Of course, being a musician is viable. And that I think is something that we just, you know, they're, they're, that's it, no contest. Um, it's how we make that viability um, thrive in the future post COVID and how we support our artists in getting through it right now. So um, we have, as I said, like everybody moved our work online and um, some of that has been paid performing opportunities. So it's keeping, as Barbara says, musicians are feeling undervalued. Our artists had um, 80, some of them, uh, no, I'll have to try and get this right, between 80 and 100%, the majority of their income was on performing and that went. So of course they've got some teaching, of course they've got some side hustles, but it's about performing and that's gone. So um, we've tried to give them what work we can, keep them valued as artists, keep them paid so they can pay their rent, pay their mortgage, pay to get food on their table, all of these things. Um, and there of course have been some schemes that some of them can apply to, um, some of them can apply to some of the time. It's definitely not everybody applying to all of the schemes. Um, and we're kind of muddling through it just now. The other thing that we've done is, we're, well, we're now doing a lot of Zoom concerts, so there is live work going on. Of course, it's not the same, um, but there is interaction with that work, and it means that we can get into most of our venues. We also did outdoors concerts when that was possible. And the other thing that we've been trying to do to just keep, keep the spirits up, both of artists and our audiences, um, is, um, well, certainly for our artists, we've put training sessions online, we've got social events online so they can meet peer to peer, um, chat with each other. We've done training on things that we maybe wouldn't do otherwise, including um, to do with sustainability and how to be a green musician. There are huge issues post COVID in how music works, how international touring works. It's not sustainable if we want to save our planet. Um, so there's quite a lot to look at there, a lot to learn. There's a lot coming up for artists with Brexit, getting their heads around that, how that's going to work, how careers can flourish and thrive in the future. Um, I love this idea about the cities um, and a regeneration through the arts. It's just fantastic. And I feel that coming out of COVID, we're going to all have to stay a little bit closer to home. Um, I mean, we're already finding that some of our artists are understandably losing some of their self-confidence in what they're doing. And that might not necessarily be the actual performance of music, but it's how they communicate with an audience verbally, which has always been quite a challenge because you're not taught that from a young age. Um, you're not taught that at conservatoire, but that sort of interaction through, through talking, through verbal communication is also very important. So, um, it's about keeping that confidence up. And I think if you do it step by step, if we do it a little bit incrementally, we're not going to get back to what we were all doing straight away. And I think keeping it local is very much part of that, these local connections. So for us, the care home that might be around the corner in the next street, or the special school that you know that a relative of your friend goes to or something like that. Just building on these local connections and, and growing um, from there and, and, and restarting everything from there, but very much with a fresh look at how um, we incorporate ongoing sustainability into our work and also diversity, which will be um, a, a very much an ongoing theme of my own organisation going forward. There is, thank you, Carol. There is, um, there is a real opportunity, isn't there, for the industry to take a moment here with itself and look at things like sustainability and technology use. I, I know a lot of people already trying to factor paid live streams into global tours, big tours, because suddenly they've realised they can reach places they were never going to tour. Um, and people are willing to pay a ticket. So there's potential, potential incremental revenue from there and development but also something that struck me you know when you're saying people losing their confidence but 
a friend of mine, a very large promoter in New Zealand, they've just started putting shows on again. And Taiwan, of all places, is already putting on, I think, 20,000 capacity shows again. So it's, it's, it's happening. But um, they couldn't find any crew. When they went out to do stuff, a crew had taken jobs elsewhere to, to support themselves. So, I mean, I, we, clearly, because we can see countries coming out of this, there is, it is viable, there's, a, there's an industry there, but are we also potentially at risk maybe of, of if we don't look after people now, that they're not going to be there at the end of this? Check to and anyone that would like to? May I, may I just jump in? Um, yes, I, think that is a, I think that is a key point, is, you know, how do we ensure the sustainability of musicians for the future? And live music is, is a key area, as several of the panellists have already talked about, is being severely impacted by this. Um, and we know that musicians are having to go and find alternative um, employment or, or ways to pay the bill. But quite frankly, that's what they've always had to do. They have to do a portfolio of work in order to have a sustainable professional career as a musician, as a live musician. But what's happened is, um, as Carol already said, the performance portfolio went overnight. So regardless of whether or not they were performing in healthcare settings, if they were performing in a pub or in another venue, all of that went overnight. But also many of our musicians also at various points in their career have had to rely on another job in the hospitality to all be a taxi driver, all these other roles that they've had or the hat that they've had to put on in order to get them to this stage. So it's, it's, it's not just about looking at music in its own sort of bubble is looking about all these other aspects that, that play an impact on the musicians that are trying to have a professional career with this. But if they are out of the game, if you like, for too long, how can they return to that? And also, what are the opportunities going to be? It's not going to be switch the light on, you know, overnight and suddenly we're going to be back to performing 5,000 um, uh, care homes across the UK. It's going to take time, as Carol said, to phase that return and phase that return in a way that's safe for both um, the people that are receiving it, but also so that the musicians feel safe doing that as well. So fantastic to hear that some places are already opening up to 20,000 you know, capacity, but for some people, they will not feel comfortable with that for a long time. Absolutely. Just, sorry, go on, Danny. Sorry, yeah, I just wanted to chime in on that a little bit, just to speak a little bit more to the... The, the kind of the crew and and, and the, the supporting factors because you know a lot of this has kind of highlighted the the actual roles at play behind the scenes and and how fundamentally fragile it all is and 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 you know as soon as as you rightly highlighted as soon as the the the, the payday from touring or from festivals has gone away they've just switched they've just pivoted found new work and you know incredibly you know versatile and resilient human beings but the actual profession that they've chosen and and become experts in to deliver these high kind of um you know uh, th these incredibly you know dynamic live performances have uh, is all gone away so they've they've had to find new ways and, and i absolutely right barbara like you know the 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 versatility from from the music sector as a whole is kind of notorious and how it complements all of these other sectors i think this is almost if, if we're going to try and glean any light or positivity from from this past you know few months this past year is that we're able to see how much influence this sector has on other things and how important the roles are and not just from an economic point of view but just from all of the other kind of verticals of the career and and and, and kind of as i said before the, the kind of reputational value of it but i think it's also played an impact on the audience and the audience has changed slightly because you know, going from a very kind of digital performance fatigue in, in the early lockdown period to now seeing really benevolent kind of engaged audiences from around the world tuning into their favourite artists, donating various ways and how the artists have then responded to that to be more in tune with their audience, to give them, you know, merchandise in, in a more bespoke manner or, you know, not just mass, mass producing tour t-shirts, but actually developing really kind of unique bits of, of of merchandise and content and how they can actually I, i've experienced it firsthand with one of my artists who you know we've we've had to kind of move his whole business online and 
he's he's just taken to it like a duck to water and he's been able to you know kind of almost offer the audience far more value than what he was doing before and through that he's got you know a, a really engaged engaged crowd so moving forward that that will kind of play a, f a fundamental part but i think you know we've learned a lot from what's happened and that will influence how the sector is seen how the sector behaves and also just highlighting some of the other value points across, yeah, across the industry absolutely and just on value points because but barbara we haven't had a chance to dig in but you mentioned um in your comment before on on care homes and i just you are an expert authority on this, but can we have a little talk about the actual impact of music on people? Can you tell us a little bit about your work and, and can you, you know, e explain to us the, the real benefits, health benefits of music? Yeah, I mean, I'm quite struck right at the beginning when Gerard said, you know, we might be under measuring the impact of music and certainly on the on health and well-being. I think that it is undervalued in terms of the transformative effect it can have, unless you're experiencing that yourself. I mean, the work, there's a well-documented bank of evidence and research which shows, obviously, that we all have a physiological and a psychological reaction to music. It's very personal, it's very individual. It plays markers in your life for key significant moments um, throughout your, your lifetime. And we know from the live music sessions that we share in a range of healthcare settings, so hospitals, hospices, care homes, community center, settings such as day centres, that live music help people to feel relaxed. It helps them to feel connected. It relieves frustration, stress, isolation. It can reduce the perception of pain. And overall, live music helps to improve people's mental, physical and emotional health. I mean, what I've seen when I've seen it in critical care units, for example, is just how transformative the live music is in terms of the relationship between the patient, the families and the healthcare professionals and the residents and the carers. And what we find, so when I went to one probably about a year ago now, um, the healthcare staff nurse said to me, they just love having the live music on the ward because for them and the ICU and HDU, it's a very stressful situation. It's very noisy. It's very busy. Um, what happens is that it relaxes the atmosphere. It slows down the busyness and quietens the constant machinery. And what that staff member said to me was that it helps her to take a breath, to pause, and as a result, she gives better care. And that's what's really important. So it's, it can feel really simple when you say it, but when you hear from the staff member that is providing that care, the difference that it makes, and also hearing from the patient themselves, so one of our trustees within ICU, and she said that she heard music and it reminded her that she had a life to come back to. So, you know, it's really simple, but it's extremely powerful for people's health and well-being. And we have been able to translate that into, you know, the this current era, if you like. As Carol said, we've been able to go online, but what we've been really clear about is it still has to have that personal connection and engagement. But what Danny was talking about in relation to that artist, it's not every single musician is able to do that. To translate how you do that in person to an online session is really tricky. And we wanted to make sure that we were retaining that interactive and personal element because that's what gives the health and wellbeing benefit. To people across the UK. And with the lockdown, social isolation was only exacerbated and we knew that that would increase. And for people almost overnight, they went into social isolation. Social isolation. Most people, it builds up over a period of time, but overnight, a whole population of people were suddenly socially isolated and lonely. And so we were clear that our live stream programme had to connect with everybody for the benefit of their health and well-being. And Carol, have you seen that also across? Absolutely, the I think it's it's that profound effect um, that it's very difficult to explain because it is actually in so many ways intangible because it's something that's just built deep into our psyche as part of how human beings evolved. Um, and of course, there, as Barbara mentioned, there's a, there's a lot of um, evidence that's now built up to, to try to prove all of that. But I think you get it when you're in these situations and you see someone who has been um, perhaps suffering from great anxiety, agitation in their care, perhaps 
not eating properly, not sleeping properly, not being cooperative. And that it maybe sounds a bit exaggerated, but that can just all disappear um, because music can really relieve stress and agitation. And then bit by bit, all the other bits of life just, you know, they fall into place so much more easily. And um, there is so much in common with what Barbara's organisation does and my own. And I don't know if Barbara would agree with me, but I think she would, that it's still not enough. You know, we should, we could be having music in care homes when we get back to what we did before every day of the week. And in some ways it still wouldn't be enough because the power and the potential is just so great. Um, and not just in care homes, in day centres for people with disabilities, people with mental health issues, um, people that are suffering in all kinds of ways. Music really is um, just amazing what it does to all of our well-being. Um, yeah, but within, within, I mean, we so even in in our panel so far today, we've covered that it, it's good for the economy. We contribute to the economy. It's great for the regions. There's opportunities for music post COVID within the regions. It's great for creative and critical thinking, both in terms of education and improving society widely. And it's really good for our health. So, I mean, it, it, an interesting place to start for from from. A music you know an industry that the government think perhaps isn't viable in some ways it certainly sounds like it's viable to me I mean can we can we the, the thing is I think a lot of it is political because music has been pigeonholed into culture which is fair enough in a way but actually music touches every aspect of everyone's lives and if it could somehow be embedded into every single political portfolio um, as a part of something that is just part of our lives, then I think we'd be in a different situation. But I don't think we're quite there yet, I'm afraid. Do, do we think, or and anyone feel free to jump in on this, are, are there, what are the biggest opportunities at the moment, do we think? If you put, put aside perhaps how the governments are, are, are reacting or the state of it, what, what are the opportunities coming out of COVID for, for music? Um, I would say there's lots of opportunities, not just coming out of COVID, but just looking further ahead. Maybe the best way to think about them is grassroots and global. Coming back to what Carol was saying about local, what Danny was saying about uh, ecosystems in cities, there's great opportunity. People's behaviour is changing, their future work is changing, and we've seen through the crisis how important not having music is, and therefore how by implication how important live venues, etc., are. Um, work. One immediate thing would be to work with local authorities to make sure the national planning guidelines that they have to adhere to offer protection to live music venues. Working to make sure that the industry is measured properly, as Carol touched on, I touched on at the very beginning, it's buried within the creative sector. Hence, within the creative sector, it's also buried with the visual performing arts. All of those are individually important, but the industry almost needs to sort of break out and show how it should be measured and hence how it should be seen as a standalone. And therefore it needs ambassadors to speak up for it, whether it's from orchestras to live performances elsewhere. But the global aspect is also very important. Um, uh, I tend to say that the three things a country needs to survive in the future, or at least one of them is one of the three Cs, cash, commodities, or creativity. Cash is the financial resources Commodities is natural resources. Creativity is the human resources. And music directly comes into the human resources and indirectly contributes to the sort of cash, the financial resources. So it's pushing that. And obviously, we need, one aspect of an opportunity is to offset your downside risks. Leaving the EU has challenges because it's a change in terms of the way in which we do things. We must make sure as part of that Brexit deal, and it may well happen anyway, that touring passports are embedded. The EU blue, blue card, I think it's called, is there for non-EU performers to go to the EU. So it should be an easy transition. But also one has to recognise globally and the internet, the technology aspect. The real dynamic part of the world economy is the Indo-Pacific. Seems like a long way away, but from India in the West to America in the East. English is a natural language, a big part of that. You look at demographics, um, 
One in 12 of the world's population is an Indian under 27. India's natural language is English. You go to Africa, a uh, dynamic part of the world's population. So in some respects, we need to be broadening our horizons as well as focusing locally. So the opportunities are, let's offset the downside risks linked to the uncertainty leaving the EU. Let's offset the downside risks in terms of trying to protect local music venues through the guidelines, speak up for the industry, and then start to think about global in terms of one aspect and grassroots in terms of another aspect. So working together, and maybe if you pulled anyone off from the music industry, they'll point out what the first natural thing is that average pay in the music industry if you're a live performer is well below the UK national average. Um, and that can only be addressed by the industry collectively coming together to address that issue. Yeah, absolutely. Um, anyone else? got? Uh, what, what do you think are the biggest opportunities? Stefan, I just saw your hand go up. Yes. So actually, I just really wanted to support this idea of, of thinking about it in, you know, locally and globally. And because that might actually be really two different subsectors or ways of thinking uh, about it. And, but one of the things that actually is quite positive, I would say, uh, out of uh, the COVID is that we have realized probably that well, we'll have to use more digital tools than we used to in the past in some ways. And so there was a push for that. But at the same time, we could actually really see how much we miss so many of, you know, this, the life dimension, the social dimensions, the, you know, the music, the art, the culture and being together. And so I think that in terms of demand, there is actually something which is very positive uh, as well for you know, the, the music industry in that. Uh, and, and locally, I would say that, you know, all these ideas of, of uh, um, music cities and of the local business, I think that, you know, we've, we've heard about healthcare, education, and so there are a lot of many other things that uh, should be factored in when we think about the music industry, how musicians can contribute to society, and perhaps what are the other uh, uh, occupations or places where they can actually use the skills and contribute in a visible way uh, you know to continue to value the, 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 the profession that ties into a question we've just been asked so i'm, I'm going to put this to you all but um it's in the chat if you want to read it uh what do you think we need to do in order to protect our performers for generations to come is it more government funding and subsidy uh culture change or new business models and stefan it sounds like there you were saying actually maybe looking at new business opportunities new business models and anyone want to answer that yeah, if we don't have so. instrumental tuition built into education from the outset, then I think the logic is that we're not going to have performers for the future. So we've got to start when children are small, when it's the right time to learn an instrument and to learn music. Um, that's a little bit separate from music education in the wider sense, which because not everyone wants to learn an instrument and nor should they. Um, but I think music education should be available to everyone. And indeed, instrumental tuition should be available. And then it's up to people themselves whether they take it up. It's not just about the tuition. It's then, of course, about instruments, access to high quality instruments, access to group activity. Um, music is a social, for the most part, a social experience. You make music with other people, for other people. You share, you share your music at every turn. So there's got to be um, provision of things like transport and venues for kids that are learning music. So um, if we don't have all that, I'm not quite sure how we're going to have performers in the future. Um, so yeah, that's kind of where I reckon it starts. Um, I think as well, just, just, to lead, just to lead on from that, something that um, uh, that Gerard mentioned before that I think, you know, and, and that we've been talking about is, is this kind of recognition of the, uh, the, the kind of the roles at play and also how the, the policy makers or the policies that exist don't ne necessarily facilitate spaces for people to create. So when we're talking about performers of the future, the main issue is, is that the places in which those performers you know, would traditionally access to learn how to perform, whether it be rehearsal spaces or, you know, affordable rehearsal spaces, the smaller venues where they kind of, I guess, firstly learn how to not do it and then grow to, into their craft and, and build audiences. They're the kind of really fragile part of the fabric, which if, if we don't have more protection around that, I mean, there have been measures over the past few years to help build in different policies or, or even 
Um, we've not got it fully into legislation yet, but but things around agent of change, which prote protects places that exist to, against new developments and, and means that there has to be an element of mitigation of the, the potential noise issues, licensing and, and all of this kind of, we're moving forward into a new age of different spaces and, and more dense urban centers. That needs to be protected by proactive policy, proactive licensing measures, a recognition on how, as we've discussed throughout this whole time, music plays a fundamental part of the greater value of a city. So that needs to be recognized, you know, from, from the top down and there needs to be certain measures in place. Now, the, the deeper we go in the behind the scenes um, kind of facilitation of music, the better we are able to not only develop the right kind of policy and, 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 and measures, but also to educate the people that can become the future crew, the future venue and license holders, the future people who actually go above and beyond to facilitate the performers to occupy those stages and for the audiences to take that away. You know, I think that's that's the main thing for me. We're, we we have the information now. There are studies around the, the positive values of music in all of its in all of its roles. We also have now the acknowledgement of all of these different factors. So now we're able to, I think move forward with much more kind of informed decisions and, and that needs to infiltrate further and be actually built into how we um, manage cities and, and countries as a whole moving forward. And I guess just, just to kind of lean into it a bit as well, you know, to, talking about subsidies, I think that's a very dangerous path to go down, but there does need to be more subsidized kind of help for, for musicians, particularly contemporary musicians, because they do drive a lot more of the economic impact of music in that sense and a lot more of the the, the nighttime economy side side of music so that needs to be recognized further as well as not just a kind of cultural heritage arts thing but more of a actual value to the economy and to the reputation of the country but that needs to be kind of uh, I'm, I'm not an expert in that sector and i don't necessarily um, kind of suggest we go down the a, a kind of France or a Canadian system where there are there are quite a lot of, of funding in place for these things. There needs to be a kind of middle ground that we are still able to have performers that are, you know, can can kind of go off and occupy all areas of music creation in order to be able to develop the the kind of I guess the innovation around music that we've always harboured as a country. There's also, I mean, the the actual use cases for music there's never been more content generated and there's never been more music made in in any time in history and we have the success of platforms like TikTok, youtube you know all of the big tech platforms that are quite heavily reliant in some ways on music usage who are now starting to be licensed and i think you know when we look at innovation going forward and and new revenue sources getting licensing in place across these large tech companies is actually pretty vital to to putting some value back into whether you're someone you know there's people making a fortune out of making beats in their bedroom there's 18 year olds making a lot of money just putting a beat together in their bedroom and and, and putting that out and i think there are, there are more ways actually in, in some ways to make money than ever before but it's crowded and the, like you say the space is going I know in London a lot of the large rehearsal rooms have gone they haven't survived Covid so if that's happening in London it worries me for, for the region so we, we certainly need that so we've got about seven minutes left does anyone anyone else want to chip in on that one you're not quiet no I've got a very oh no sorry Stefan go on I saw your finger there sorry yeah so I wanted to get back on the subsidy thing you know uh, uh, being French and living in France, so that I guess you know it's a different take on 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 that. But I think for the COVID, you know, the question is really of compensating uh, people who couldn't work just because you know the situation was what it was, and and governments had to take an administrative decision actually, you know. So it it, it was so here there are some kind of responsibility that are coming with it. Just as wanted to remind us, it's also a question of value, and actually that's also part of the subsidy thing, you know, and, and sometimes of a social contract, you know, it's, uh, you know, French people like to pay more taxes, and so they subsidize some of the people, uh, the British people like to pay less taxes, and they have different relationship to subsidies, you know, it's, uh, uh, but that's part of a more societal views of, you know, how the economy and society functions, what, what's covered by whom. 
And there are different possible models for that indeed, you know, that's, uh, you know, one of the big questions in France is uh, how many artists do we want, you know, how, we, how, how, do you, how many do we want to subsidize and which ones or how, and that's what, that other question, it's not so much, you know, should the government pay a little bit to have a lively uh, uh, artistic sector, uh, but question is that not everyone could, you know, so that's to have, you have a real, um, a challenge, but we have to keep in mind variations and actually looking sometimes outside of England is uh, an, an interesting way to think about this. Yes, it is, and something I feel like we should probably definitely do more often. But I mean, I've, I've worked with a lot of Canadian acts over the years who've been given small fortunes to bring themselves over here and, and launch themselves successfully. So there are some interesting uh, interesting ways around it. Just as going, I've had a very specific question that Carol, I just want to ask to see whether you did or not, because someone asked it early on. How have you managed to keep live music in care homes? I think I probably answered it in the context of another question. Um, well, when the pandemic started, it wasn't of course live. Um, I don't think any of us seems hard to believe, but we hadn't used Zoom before. Um, so it was recorded, specially recorded video concerts. Okay, so um, how it was, yeah. Which were released at certain times. And then we did it outside while outdoor performances were allowed and the weather wasn't absolutely freezing. Um, we were able to do concerts in care home gardens, um, which was just lovely, actually. It was really nice. Um, and then what we're doing now is, is via Zoom. Um, but we're we're yeah. not allowed to be in, of course not. Yeah, no, I just have, sorry, someone just reminded me to ask it, and I did wonder how that. But, yeah, worked. but but there, I mean, it's like other things that have cropped up in this um, conversation. There are advantages as well. Doing it by Zoom, we've found that two care homes in the same group can come together. So older people yeah. in care who would normally just be with their own group can now join with another group on Zoom, and we can have the interaction. And the video recorded concerts, they invited interaction and, and participation, whether that might be singing along to a chorus or tapping your feet, clapping your hands, or um, maybe just sort of sitting back and relaxing and thinking about a particular theme that's recurrent in the music. All of these kind of things that we would normally do to um, engage people in, in active listening or um, just kind of chilled out listening, uh, we could still do. Um, but of course, we didn't have the two-way conversation, which is, is, is a great miss. I think yeah. as well, there's, there's um, sorry to jump in, there's, there's, there's something to be, I guess, unpacked around how music can play a, a deeper role in, you know, a, a, with like social prescription and how bringing people together and trying to fight those kind of loneliness and, and depression and things like that through these kind of events in, in a more, I guess, you know, post-COVID managed way will actually be a way to not only help the cause, but also provide some funding back into the sector if it's if it's proven to 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 play a kind of um a benefit with that i mean i'm not again i don't know the ins and outs of it but there's certainly something there and particularly when we're again talking about spaces being kind of vacant and, and we can occupy that with things that could work in in new dimensions and being able to you know have audiences in in different ways in you know not traditional music venues but maybe in shopping center spaces, for example. Yeah, in other places. And um, I'm so sorry, we could have had this discussion all day, but I can see that we've only got around a minute and a half left. So if I may, I'd like to end this session just asking you all, it, it, hopefully within a minute and a half, if I can get this question out quick enough. Um, what would be your one hope for the, for the advancement of the creative industries going forward and in whatever that might look like in your field. What's what's your one hope sort of looking into to 2021? Um, and if I could start with Danny, please, I'm just going to run through the order on my screen. I think it's just it's a bit, bit lame, but I think it's just what I mentioned before. I think just greater recognition around the roles and how they are mechanisms to deliver greater value in, 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 in our cities and in our places. Um, yeah without dwelling too much but yeah thank you Gerard um, well the government can play a role in terms of financial support for the arts extending it to the grassroots organizations through the next phase but while the government plays a role ultimately it's got to be industry led and it's almost embracing change and putting into practice many of the things we've talked about yeah couldn't agree more Carol 
I wish I'd thought in advance that there would be this kind of final question. Um, I mean, to be perfectly honest, I think it's for us, it's strive, survive, and hopefully thrive. Lovely answer. Thank you. Stefan. Yeah, I hope it remains um, creative, human, and continues to bring us a lot of joy. You, you and I both. And finally, Barbara, please. Oh, we want to be able to return to sharing joy through live music. It's simple as that. Yeah, yeah, I think we can all agree on that. Um, we've come to the end of our session. Thank you so, so much for, for joining us today. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Great Thanks. pleasure. Thank you.